EPCO Educational Topic 52, Cervical Disease and Neoplasia. Globally, cervical cancer is the second most common cancer among women. It is the most common cause of mortality from gynecologic malignancy, accounting for 250,000 deaths per year. In the United States, cervical cancer incidence and mortality have decreased substantially. It is now thought of as a preventable cancer that is caused by a virus called human papillomavirus, or HPV. The objectives of this video are to describe the pathogenesis and risk factors for cervical cancer, list the guidelines for cervical cancer screening, describe the initial management for a patient with an abnormal pap smear, describe the symptoms and physical findings of a patient with cervical cancer. There are over 100 types of HPV and 30 affect the anogenital tract. 15 of these 30 are high-risk HPV types and the majority of cervical cancers are caused by four of these, 16, 18, 31, and 45. Low-risk HPV types are not associated with cancer and low-risk types 6 and 11 are associated with genital warts. HPV infects the cells of the cervix. Let's take a moment now to discuss cervical anatomy. The cervix is covered by both squamous and columnar epithelium. The squamo-columnar junction, or SCJ, where these two meet, is an important landmark where over 90% of lower genital tract cancers arise. The squamous epithelium is on the vaginal side of the SCJ, and the columnar epithelium is on the endocervical side of the SCJ. During menarche, there is an estrogen surge, and this causes the cervix to mushroom and drag the glandular, or columnar epithelium of the endocervix, onto the vaginal exposed portion of the cervix. Thus, the SCJ at menarche will be at or close to the vaginal part of the external os. As the woman ages, the SCJ recedes up the endocervical canal, The transformation zone is this area between the old SCJ and the new SCJ, depicted by this area with the pink stripes. This is the area where columnar epithelium is replaced by squamous epithelium in a process called squamous metaplasia. The cells that are undergoing metaplasia are vulnerable to various carcinogens such as HPV. Colposcopy is how we clinically visualize this cervical anatomy. A colposcope is a binocular stereo microscope with magnification. Acetic acid is placed on the cervix, which dehydrates cells, causing those with large nuclei to appear white. These white cells will be those undergoing metaplasia or dysplasia. This colposcopic photograph shows a cervix treated with acetic acid. The original squamous epithelium is pink and smooth, and the columnar epithelium is red and irregular. Here is the old SCJ, and the transformation zone with squamous metaplasia is white. Let's now focus on some virology, and here is our character, Mr. HPV. Most of the time, if he infects a host, the infection will be transient, and the host's immune system will be able to eradicate the HPV before it causes change. Certain risk factors will increase the likelihood that the HPV infection will stay. If the host is immunocompromised secondary to HIV or is on immunosuppression medications, then there will be a higher incidence of infection and progression. Cigarette smoking is our second risk factor, and smokers have a 3.5 times greater rate of cervical cancer than non-smokers. The carcinogens from cigarette smoke are found in high concentrations in the cervical mucus of smokers. Other risk factors include anything that will increase the chance of exposure to HPV, including early cordarchy, multiple sexual partners, and sexually transmitted diseases. Let's discuss cervical cancer screening. The pap test is inexpensive and non-invasive, and we are now able to test for HPV at the time of the pap test. Adding the HPV testing has allowed us to space out the interval between testing. However, it could now be confusing for patients and medical students, so let's spend a moment to clarify screening recommendations. The screening recommendations differ by age. Here is our young patient. Screening should start at age 21. For women between 21 and 29 years old, pap test alone should be every three years. HPV testing is not performed in this age group, for HPV prevalence approaches 20% for teens and women in their early 20s. For older women, age 30 to 64, pap test and HPV testing every five years is preferred, or pap test alone can be tested every three years. For women who are 65 or older, pap test screening can stop if she has adequate negative screening and no history of cervical dysplasia greater than CIN2 within the last 20 years. It is important to note that more than half of patients who develop cervical cancer have not been screened appropriately, and among women diagnosed with invasive cervical cancer, one half have never had a pap test. Women who are at highest risk of being rarely or never screened for cervical cancer are minority women, low socioeconomic status, foreign-born, and women with no usual source of health care. Let's move now to management of an abnormal pap test. 
Pap tests give a cytological result, and two common abnormal cytologies are low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, or LSIL, and high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, or HSIL. A colposcopy is the next step, and the biopsies from the colposcopy will give a histologic diagnosis. There are two common classification systems for describing the results of colposcopic-directed biopsies. We'll start with the Bethesda system. This system describes the biopsies obtained at the time of colposcopy as cervical intraepithelial neoplasias, or CIN, and there is CIN 1, 2, and 3. These are classified by the extent that cervical epithelium is replaced by abnormal cells. CIN1 has one-third of the epithelium involved with abnormal cells, CIN2 has two-thirds, and CIN3 has full thickness involvement. In 2012, the lower anogenital squamous terminology with the clever acronym LAST was introduced. In this terminology system, the histological biopsy results are classified as either LSIL or HSIL, mirroring the same terminology that was used for the cytology results. Lesions that would have been classified as CIN1 are now LSIL. Most CIN3 is classified as HSIL. Specimens that were CIN2 or an unclear CIN3 can now be tested with P16 immunostaining that helps diagnostic reproducibility. Specimens that are P16 negative are classified as LSIL and those that are positive are classified as HSIL. To summarize, when a pap smear is abnormal, then a colposcopy should be performed. The results of the colposcopic directed biopsies triage the next step of management. Expectant management can be used for CIN1 or LSIL because of its high rate of regression and low rate of progression. Immediate treatment is needed for CIN2 and CIN3 or HSIL because of their higher rates of progression to cervical cancer. There are two approaches to immediate treatment, ablation, for example cryotherapy or laser ablation, and excisional methods, cold knife cone or LEAP procedure. The principal difference between ablation and excisional methods is that ablation provides no diagnostic information. Additional factors to consider are future childbearing plans and patient compliance. Both a cone biopsy and LEAP procedure excise the transformation zone. This following video, courtesy of Dr. Rich Lieberman, shows a LEAP procedure. The cervix has been treated with Lugol solution, which stains normal tissue with iodine. Dysplastic cells appear non-stained or white. A loop electrode is used to excise the transformation zone. and then a roller ball cautery is used to obtain hemostasis. Let's move now to cervical cancer. Despite the progress made in early detection and treatment, there are approximately 11,000 new cases of cervical cancer diagnosed annually with 3,870 deaths. The average age of diagnosis is 50 years old. The signs and symptoms of cervical cancer are variable and nonspecific, including watery vaginal discharge, intermittent spotting, and postcoital bleeding. The cervix can appear normal in appearance, or there can be a visible cervical lesion. Large tumors may appear to replace the cervix entirely. The cervical cancer usually arises from the transformation zone. Here is a photograph of cervical cancer. Note the irregular, friable surface of the transformation zone. Let's conclude by discussing prevention and future directions. We began this video by discussing the high and low risk strains of HPV. The quadrivalent or Gardasil vaccine protects against the low risk HPV strains of 6, 11, and high risk strains 16 and 18. This quadrivalent HPV vaccine has been shown to prevent 91% of new infections. Current HPV vaccines are only indicated right now for prophylaxis and women who receive the HPV vaccine should still follow regular cervical cytology screening. In January 2015, the American Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology and the Society for Gynecologic Oncology recommended consideration of primary HPV testing for cervical cancer screening. Stay tuned for guidelines and recommendations will continue to evolve. This concludes the APCO video on cervical disease and neoplasia. We have discussed the pathogenesis and risk factors for cervical cancer and discussed recommendations for screening and management of abnormal pap tests.